Hello, fiends and ghouls. This is Dead McMame with here with a awesome interview that I'd like to bring to you. I'd like to introduce to you fiends Fred Freeze, who's the son of the legendary Paul Freeze. Hello, Fred. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing today, Fred? I'm doing good. As you know, uh, this past week was the 45th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland, and we wanted to honor your father this week with a little bit of a discussion about your memories and just whatever you would like to discuss about your father. What are you I'm honored. Very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, what was your favorite memory of your father, if you could think of one? My favorite memory? Uh, there, there is no one favorite memory. Uh, it would have to be the, the whole time I got to be with my dad because after the age of six, my parents got divorced and seeing my dad was at a premium. So I, I cherished every moment I could be with him. So it, it had to be all the times I was ever with my dad. There, there's no one particular moment. I, I just loved being with my dad whenever I had the opportunity. Was he the type of person with... Um very much we think of actors sometimes with booming voices or was he a very tender person or how was he dad could be very tender dad dad was a very emotional guy um his public face was not his private face by any means um in in public i mean and at work especially professionally he was considered almost uh uh well, a lot of bravado, always, always on, always with a booming voice, always in public. But at home, he could be very, uh, I wouldn't say quiet, but, but, but dad could be uh, very tender, very, he was very emotional. Um, he, he took things to heart a lot, especially when bad things happened to friends of his. Um, he also had a lot of uh, difficulty with his marriages and his wives, and he could he could get into arguments and uh, very emotional. I found that also that tends to come across with someone's work when they get can get emotional and, and different things like that. But I, I think it's fascinating. I, I read part of the book, which was Welcome Foolish Mortals by mm -hmm. Ben Omar, and what a profile into your father it was very interesting to see just all the different sides of him and just what many people see him only as the ghost host or only as boris badenoff or only as captain crunch and so it's really fascinating to see uh, uh, an in-depth picture oh well, he was definitely a three-dimensional person a uh, lot of lot of a lot of stuff going on. What do you think he would say was his best work? His best work? Well, the most popular thing probably was Rocky and Bullwinkle. People, people love Boris Badenoff. Definitely. In fact, I was reading in the book about how, how he would just carry those cartoon recording sessions and how he would be around June Foray and all those other voiceover greats and just be able to have a great time doing it. I wish I was a fly on the wall when I could hit listen to some of those sessions. Well, I was able to sit there f for some of those sessions and they had a blast and they were one big family. They, they, it was a, a very rare thing and I know that was his f probably favorite time and as those things had finished out and the Jay Ward productions were done. I think the last one they did was Hoppity Hooper. Um, he missed all of them. He missed doing all that. You know, it was it was great doing the Doughboy and it was great doing uh, like the ghost host and things. But that was basically dad by himself. He, he was really a, uh, an ensemble player and love to perform with other people. I know I've heard some of his work with the older radio programs, and, and, and many of our listeners don't know what that was like when you had ensemble players. You had microphones in front of you, 
and then they all had to work together and it was a live production and that's really different than what they see nowadays with all this pre-recorded type of recording and and when things were live i bet you things they just had to be on they had to be on and they had to hopefully do it without making mistakes because there there were no second chances and there was uh definitely adrenaline it's not much different than being on stage doing a live performance so it, it it was a thrill for them i know it was and it was just the ability to think on your feet and think on your feet with a script in front of you and then know that your what your your contributions are very important to the whole entire production absolutely and i know that um Nowadays, scripts are usually on the, the stand in front of you, and people flail about with their arms and things. But I, I know that from the pictures that Dad used to hold his script while performing. So there wasn't a lot of that motion that we're used to seeing these days. And for me, that would have been fascinating to watch because I'm right. Uh, you're right. Nowadays, people flail about, and, and back then, they just... A lot of them didn't do that. They held this script in front of them, and you just had to use your voice to create the entire character. Absolutely. And, and what a great job they did. And I know as a kid watching the Rocky and Bullwinkle program, just what, what they were able to do in a cartoon version back then, and now how it, it even holds true now, just, just the artistry that they had. I'm fascinated by it. And especially because the the animation was so bad. I mean, the Rocky and Bullwinkle stuff was very cheaply drawn, but it seemed to fit. It, it, it didn't detract from the entertainment value, and their performance carried it. And I always loved the music and the sound effects that were in Rocky and Bullwinkle, and it didn't matter that the animation wasn't, you know, the best in the world, but it, it was... Uh, very special thing. And especially in voice work, as you found, or I'm learning too, is, is the ability of the voice actor to carry the, the character so that the listeners fully believe that the character is alive. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that was what distinguished my father and Mel Blanc and Dawes Butlers. They, they were the characters. They, they weren't just doing voices. They, they actually became those characters. It, it's, it's fascinating. Fascinating to me because even to this day as I walk in as a guest at Disneyland and to watch the reaction of the people in the foyer of the Haunted Mansion to be drawn into the the voice and the character of the ghost host, even to watch the little reaction of little kids, mm -hmm. even to this day, that recording that was done so many years ago still has power. Absolutely. And, and you know that he did a lot of different versions of that before they settled on what we call the ghost host. He had, he had done that same script as Peter Lorre and as several other types of characters. They, they tried a lot of different things before finally settling in on that voice, which, of course, has become legendary. I know our fiends and ghouls listening would be interested to see what it was like or what you could remember from him about those recording sessions. Was it, how was it decided upon to get to the ghost host? Uh, well, I, I wish I could give you more insight into that. I, I, that was obviously a decision that the producers made at the time. Um, Dad would probably not have been the person to say, this is what you should be using. They would usually put out an idea of what they wanted, and that's why he was doing so many different variations. And the closer they found what worked is what they went toward. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't at that session, so I don't know exactly what they were thinking. And I remember waiting years for the, maybe you did too, with the, the Haunted Mansion was delayed for many years for the opening of it. So we, 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 it, it seemed like they had more technical issues to deal with before they could finally open the, the, uh, the attraction. And 
fortunately, they did end up with the ghost host sound because it's it's become so popular. Yes, the attraction itself, Fiends and Ghouls, I believe, was scheduled to open in 63, but didn't open until 69, so there was a good six years where it sat dormant. Yeah, and when you're a little kid, six years is a long time. Oh, it is. <laughs> so they're waiting for it. Where's the Haunted Mansion? And then also, many of our Fiends and Ghouls also know that he did the voice work for the Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln which is on the Main Street Cinema at Disneyland. Yes, he and did. He... I, st I was in that attraction last week watching that, and, and it, that's, it's still inspiring all these years later of just his voice transporting you to the 1800s. And it, it, just, <laughs> it just seems... I, I still watch kids nowadays go in there, and they're, they're still enthralled with with Lincoln, and I think that was the entire purpose, and he really, really nailed that one. Well, and it's unfortunate that kids today can't see the Monsanto exhibit, what we called the Monsanto exhibit, where you got to be shrunken down to the size of a molecule, and Dad was the scientist saying, I'm getting smaller, smaller, and that was a terrific attraction, but they, they got rid of it to put in Space Mountain. Can I possibly survive? Yes. <laughs> they have it on the internet. I mean on YouTube you can you can listen to what it was what it was all about and but that was a fun ride because you you felt like you were going through and being looked at the giant eye looking through the microscope at you and snowflakes and everything. That, that was a terrific attraction. I like the fact also that it was using science as an attraction, so it, it really opened the eyes and the ears of everyone going through it to further research. Exactly, and that's what kids today aren't getting, so it's, it's a shame. They should bring it back. I fully agree. That's, that would, <laughs> Adventure Through Inner Space, that was one of the classic attractions. Yeah, that's what it was called. It, it was great. We just called it the Monsanto exhibit because they were the sponsors. And then also... Um, Many of us, our listeners also know that it was given a little nod to itself when Star Tours opened because I believe as you took off in the spaceship, didn't you see the microscope on the... Oh, I don't remember that. I think they did a little nod did to it. They, did they? That, yeah. That's great. So as you took off on the left-hand side of the screen was the microscope. Huh. That, that's great. So, which was your favorite Bullwinkle character? Was it Boris Vadnoff, or your father also did some work with Fractured Fairy Tales, didn't he? No, not the fairy tales. Oh, Fractured, yeah. He did Fractured Flickers, That's the right. one that was hosted by uh, Hans Conried. But um, in the actual Bullwinkle series, as far as I know, Dad never did anything for Fractured Fairy Tales, but he was always the guy that Mr. Peabody would go to visit. When he went in the Wayback Machine, Dad was always the guy, whoever it was. If it was um, Ponce de Leon or Christopher Columbus or whoever it was, Dad was always the guy that he, he went back to visit. Um, I, 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 was, I was very fond of uh, Peter Peach Fuzz. Wrong way, Peach Fuzz. Oh, yes. It was one of my favorites. Uh, that, was, that was one of my favorites. I, uh, Boris was great, but... Um, and and I I like um he did Cloyd or Gidney the one of the Moon Men when when he when he he just kind of, kind of did a you know nasally kind of character voice that I always thought that was funny. A uh, very nasally. I do remember that character. Yeah. Well, Dad used to do that when we were driving around together. He just kind of. <laughs> so what was it? Like? I also read in the book that you many times wanted to go on the attractions. Um, that your dad had voiced. What's it like for you to go in nowadays and to hear his work? Uh, well, nowadays it's just nice to be able to hear my dad. I'm one of the few people that can, you know, unless you have home movies, you know, I can hear my dad's voice. He's been gone for 26 years, and it's just kind of heartwarming to still hear my dad. I mean, it's real neat, you know. It's a little sad because I know he's gone, but. He left behind so much work and everything. I, and I don't have any recordings of him just at home, just talking, which is too bad. But 
you know, it's it's nice that I can go to YouTube and just listen to my father anytime I want to. Well, I can tell you definitely he has left an impression upon myself and on all, all of our friends that listen to this radio show. And to have the 45th anniversary come up and realize that it, it's the attraction is still going strong is a testament to your dad's work. Well, I, that's, that's, you know, really heart, heartwarming. You know, I'm, I'm really glad that's the case because he, he would have been thrilled if he was still around and knew that everybody was still paying attention to all that. Just so our fiends and ghouls know also that you yourself have done some work as far as I, I do know ringtones and different things that, that have also honored your dad's work. Um, what type of work have you done as a voiceover artist? Well, for a couple of years, I did the voice of Morocco Mole for the Cartoon Network, which Dad did for uh, the Secret Squirrel Show originally with Mel Blanc. And um, specifically for Disney, I did for the 30th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion, I, they had these kiosks at Disneyland and Disney World where you could make your own personalized CD and I did the voice of the ghost host instructing you what buttons to push and all that and I also did the same thing when the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 33rd anniversary so because dad was also voices in the Pirates of the Caribbean now in the Pirates of the Caribbean he was I, well, I remember he was the voices that you would hear in the caverns before you would hit, hit the, the ship scene uh, he was that and and several others. He was he was most of the pirates in the ride. So a lot of that yo ho ho and stuff that's mostly him. And the auctioneer and the pirate that was looking for the girl at the end. Uh, I'm not sure about every single character. I haven't been to Disneyland myself for quite some time, but uh, he he did do a lot of those characters. And that's what's also fascinating to me is it's just all the the amount of work the amount of credits that he, he has in the book that i was reading by ben omart is just it's staggering it, it is staggering but dad worked especially in the 60s mostly especially in the 60s for television and cartoon work and commercials he was working every day uh literally thousands of accounts per year to the point where he couldn't remember what he did he literally just couldn't remember, and he never brought his work home with him. That's what's also amazing, because nowadays with technology, even people that are not in the voiceover business take their work home, and there's no separation between work and home. Well, that's the advantage we have now with home studios and the Internet and you know software that you can do. Uh, even if dad did have that he wouldn't have been able to use it because he was technologically illiterate and always left the engineering to someone else my dad didn't like coping with vcrs or even the television set i mean he, <laughs> he did not he did not care for technology at all which is kind of funny because he could he could make him he could convince people that he would know everything about it by doing a narration or um because he did a lot of opening things for, uh, like, uh, I think it was Atlantis, The Lost Continent. He did narration for the opening of that movie, besides some characters in it. And it was all, uh, it was all a historical thing. And then and the, he was talking about the, you know, you, show, you see a map of the ancient world and the ancient world and this thing and that. And he knew nothing about history. He didn't, he didn't care about history or study it. But when he did the narration, he sounded like he was an absolute expert. Because Dad could do anything convincingly. But when it came to history or science or technology, he just didn't care. It's all on the power of the voice and the power of, of just just making the listener believe that you know what you're speaking about. Power of persuasion. He, My mother said he could sell a pile of dog dew. <laughs> That's really awesome, and it's, and, and I just, I'm so glad that I got to hear at least some of the work, and, and looking at the book now, I realize that there's a whole lot of other work that I have yet to listen to. I haven't heard everything he's done, 
And in fact, if it wasn't for Ben Omar and this book, Welcome Foolish Mortals, of which he has now the new revised edition out, and I recommend people get that edition and forget the first one because it's got uh, it's got more pictures in it. It's got uh, interviews that were not in the first one, and it's it's just a revised uh, copy, and it's much much better. And the credit list is just way beyond anything I was aware of because Dad never told me what he was doing, and especially all the stuff he did before I was even born. I mean, it's just an amazing list. And uh, Fred is correct because I'm holding the copy of the book that he's speaking of right now, Fiends and Ghouls, and it, it is an exhaustive list, and it, I do have the revised edition, and it, it, it is a book to get and to dive into. Well, I can also tell your, your listeners that I'm doing the audio book of this, of this book. So it will be out as an audio book through Bear Manor Media, hopefully sometime this year. I also like the quote that I see in this book right here that, that it seemed to be written by your dad, which is, life is not a dress rehearsal. Yeah. You know, I also heard uh, Dr. Laura Schlesinger, she said the same thing. But Dad obviously had this thing in his possession lot, long before that. And it's, it's a great thing to think of because people don't necessarily consider what they're doing today as relevant, that there's always some future thing to, to look, you know, that you're always looking forward that, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. Life is not a dress rehearsal, this is it. There, 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 there's no time like the present. There definitely isn't, and there's many opportunities that come your way, and then if you don't take advantage of them, you lose out on an experience. Absolutely. And every experience stays with you, even if it's negligible or it seems irrelevant. You never know when something will come back and you'll go, oh, I remember that and I can use that. My my father, when I was in uh, junior high school, I, I eventually became very interested in history, ancient history and stuff. It, be, it just became a fascination of mine. But in junior high school, it was not. I, I, I had to learn stuff in school and I hated it. And I said, Dad, I have to take this history class. What, what does this have to do with what I want to do? What does this have to do with anything? He goes, well, and he tried to make the best of it. And he said, you never know, you might want to write a script about ancient Egypt. So... You know, learn what you can, and you never know when you have to go back and refer to it. And, and he was right. You never, you never know what, what is going to end up being important to you. And you never know when you could be working with someone, and then years later you cross paths with them again. And you just never know when these connections become important. Exactly. Uh, nothing is trivial. And I was also thinking about back in the great old days of radio and everything, how much of a work ethic someone would have to have to be able to day in and day out play a character or play different characters. Or what would be fascinating to me is to hear them playing different characters on live radio where they had to switch back and forth between characters. It's just fascinating. Well, that's what Dad was uh, a master at. Dad could switch from one to the other in a heartbeat. And he did that on The Player, which was a, a series that he did for a while. And it was multiple characters that he would, you know, he didn't just record one character and then another character and they spliced it together as many people might do today. He literally switched characters like jumping off one horse onto another. I mean, he, he was amazing that way. And then with the advent of uh, stations such as Sirius Radio, I think the um, expertise of actors such as your dad, they can see those type of things now when the old radio programs are being played. And it's just fascinating to hear stations like, or, or series like Suspense, and what, what are some of the other great ones? Inner Sanctum, um, The Shadow, mm -hmm. back when 
your parents and my parents were younger, that was the type of entertainment that they had, and that was sometimes the only entertainment they had. Absolutely. And, and the guys in the background with the little sound effects, whatever it took to make it sound like a horse, you know, galloping or a door opening and a little bell. Uh, absolutely. It was, uh, it was definitely another era of entertainment. And then I remember as a little kid watching the film Donald in Mathematics Land. Huh. And hearing your dad's work as the, um, the different characters in there. And then some of our listeners would also remember him as Professor Ludwig von Drake. Yep. Absolutely. And, and that great character. And then also in George of the Jungle. I, I still laugh to this day on some of the humor in George of the Jungle. <laughs> well, he, he, he was... Uh doing his Ronald Coleman impression as ape, which was kind of funny because George was an idiot and the ape was the intellect. So, yeah, it was very funny. And then Super Chicken and all those types of cartoons. <laughs> yeah, Super Chicken was one of my favorites. I, I, I thought Bill Scott doing Super Chicken was, was hilarious. How many times do we want to go squawk like Super Chicken? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> See, to me, work like that is timeless. You could, it takes you back in time. I go back on YouTube and many of our listeners would do that. And you laugh again, just like it wasn't even a day since the first time you've heard it. And, and it was innocent humor. You know, it, it, it wasn't this in your face, gross stuff that today is very popular with you know, I, I, in, in spite of, I, I find Ren and Stippy kind of funny, but it's some of the stuff can be really grotesque and deliberately so. And back in the day, they didn't need to do that. They didn't need to because it was an innocent type of humor. And the, I think the medium of cartoons was the type that they could do almost anything with. A absolutely. I think you've got the, the uh, animation greats of Hannah and Barbera and uh, Rankin and Bass, who did those great um, stop motion puppetry that I know some of those your dad was involved with. That was his number one client toward the end of his career. They, dad lived up north of San Francisco, and Rankin Bass was the only ones that he'd fly down to LA to do work for. That, again, must have been fascinating because, again, I think in, in that time frame, that was a new technology or, a, or a, there was a great resurgence of that type of technology because the stop motion had been around for a long time, as far as I know. Well, I remember watching Gumby as a kid, and that was all stop motion, and it was a little freaky for me as a kid because they really went... Uh, you know, they broke boundaries with the kind of characters they had. And it just seemed weird for me when I, I'm talking about being like a seven or eight year old kid. It's just weird to see all this clay stuff moving around, talking, and they'd pop in and out of books and, and, and changing shapes. And, you know, looking back on it, you know, they were, they were experimenting with stop motion in a way that they had never been done before. And you look back on it now and, it, and it's, almost as relevant then as it is now. Oh, absolutely, because no one ever did anything like it. It stands alone because what they did was singularly their own. And it's, it's, it's almost like Ray Harryhausen. You know, all that stuff was so prolific and set the standards for what came after. It definitely did. And even the work that was done back then still amazes me now. I look back on YouTube and our, our listeners do and they see Gumby and Pokey and the Blockheads and all those fun characters, Davy and Goliath and other types of like that. And, and even with the advent of YouTube, I think they're still going back to the beginnings of cartoons and it, it, all of it just fascinates me. Well, we're we were lucky to grow up in that generation to to see the beginnings of this creativity. 
it's it's fascinating that it happened. I, I mean, I feel really privileged because that it really all started when I was a kid. So I, as as a kid, I was able to watch it as it was coming out. And then to see it now, having a resurgence on YouTube, that uh, the, the technology savvy people of today can look back and see how things were done back then, and just to see a resurgence of it, that that's also really good. It, it's it's great. A anything that inspires is great, and I, I know there's new technologies, and you know there's CGI, and there's all these fancy ways of making things look more realistic and so forth, but when we were growing up, we were inspired with our little eight millimeter cameras to do stop motion. I had, I had a buddy of mine that we were always doing stuff like that in you know, our own way, uh, doing that kind of stuff with spaceships crashing into buildings and all kinds of stuff. And my friend ended up becoming a director and big in the animation uh, business. I see also here that your father did a lot of work with the Return of the King and the Hobbit cartoons. And mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. what, what do you think about the resurgence with Peter Jackson and the Hobbit and the multi-million dollar blockbusters that now are on our silver screens? Well, you know, they look nice. They're, they're not really anything. It's, it, it, it's not, I don't know, it's hard to relate that to what dad did in the cartoons. Um, what dad did was much more simplistic in comparison um but but the movies are really you know spectacular to see and I, i'm sure dad would have loved to have seen them he just he, he just never made it to the cgi uh period he, he my dad died in 86 so he he it was you know cgi just hadn't taken off yet what was he like as far as hearing his own work? Was he able to to take that in, or was he very critical of himself? <laughs> I don't think he spent much time listening to himself. If he heard something on TV, he said, did I do that? He, he literally didn't remember doing it, or he at least he'd say that. But he would never really spend much time listening to himself. Um, I, How could he not be proud of what he did? I mean, as he knew when he'd go into the studio that he could deliver to the, to the producers exactly what they needed. And it's, it's in Ben's book, some of these stories about how he'd keep the client waiting. You know, they booked an hour and dad would come in and he'd talk for about 45 minutes. And you could see that the client was starting to get very nervous because time's running out and he hasn't even gotten behind the microphone. And finally, Dad would see what was going on. And in actuality, Dad was gauging the client as to what it was they wanted and how they were reacting. And finally, he'd get behind the mic and in the last 15 minutes of the session, he would knock it out, out of the park, exactly what they needed and say goodbye. That fascinates me because I would just want to see the look on the client's face as they're realizing the time is clicking by and he's talking to them. And it just, it would, to me, it must have been his business sense to be able to, to, be able to gauge that client. Absolutely. Now, D Dad was very uh, perceptive and he was also very, uh, see what the word I'm looking for, he, he, he just had a natural inclination to what was needed and he also had an incredible inner clock and where some narrators would need a stopwatch in order to make sure that their timing was right on because you'd have say you know it'd have to be exactly 58 seconds or 30 seconds or 20 seconds whatever it was dad was able to he'll do a take and he said what was that? And the guy said, well, it was two seconds over. He'd do it again, and it, was, it would always be right where it had to be. So he, he had some amazing abilities. Wow. Just, and just to think nowadays with all the technology, uh, people using uh, um, Internet, and what, what do they call that? We're able to 
go in by telephone line. Uh, yeah, phone patch, you mean? Yeah, yeah, phone patch. And and how technologically connected we are and just how back back in those times he was able to accomplish things with such a great sense of timing. Well, today we're more dependent on the technology. In, in those days, they were dependent on their own abilities. And that's what makes them stand out better. It, it, it's, it's almost like baseball back in the day when they weren't taking steroids and they were still hitting home runs and such. But nowadays, you don't know who's enhancing their abilities with technology. Definitely. How would you think, how, how would you like people to remember your father? Fondly. <laughs> Uh, with, with with a modicum of respect and and and, and, a, and a lot of understanding because if as they read the book, uh, when you find out more about my dad, it he his personal life and his predilection for things that were not part of the business sound a little strange. My father could be a little bit odd. He had a fascination for law enforcement. And he had a lot of firearms, and he used to walk around. It, it just, he used to go to later sessions wearing a, you know, ha he had a gun in his pocket. Uh, things like that might make people shake their head a little bit and go, wow, that was kind of strange. And uh, there were other things about my dad that were a little bit strange. He had uh, what seemed to be like psychic powers I, I, I don't know if, it, if it's explainable or not but my, my mother used to lose things and she'd call him and he'd be able to figure out where it was um, he'd answer telephones before they rang or he'd know who it was he he, he could be uh, he could sleep with his eyes open for instance fascinating um, he was a strange guy sometimes. My dad could just be very extraordinary is really the best word to put it because he, he just possessed amazing abilities that I would just want people to, you know, bear that in mind. And I, I think people are very forgiving these days. Uh, there's a lot of a, a big sense of understanding when people have issues you know, we're getting that now. People are coming out with saying how they suffer from this malady or that malady. And, you know, it, it, as long as their contribution to society is uh, worthwhile, we, we tend to be more accepting about the struggles that they've had. And Dad certainly struggled. He, he was, you know, he, he did not begin life. They weren't poor, but they weren't wealthy either. And Dad had to earn everything he got. That's what also fascinated me, is to have somebody who um, came from very modest means and, and then just continued to have a work ethic that was infallible. Well, he, a lot of that, too, I have to give credit. He, you know, Dad was in the Army for three or four years and fought in World War II. And had to live in the trenches and freezing cold nights and mud up to his waist and carrying the bodies of his friends and uh, hey, 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 <laughs> and I have a dog. Um, Dad was very fond of his dog too. He also had a lot of birds. I don't even know where that came from, but uh, um, Dad struggled. I mean, he, he got a purple heart because he almost died after fighting in World War II. So, you know, coming out of that must have really been something. I, that, that's something I don't, I can't relate to because I never fought in a war or put on a uniform or anything like that. But his generation were, were amazingly brave. So it, it, that does affect a person, and my dad was definitely affected by it. But I think it also works to explain the person and that's why I recommend to our listeners that they pick up this book because it, it really takes an in-depth look into Paul Fries the person 
absolutely. And, and it's fascinating because coming out of the war, of course, he was in love with this woman. He, he married this girl. You know, they, you know, they were both in their early 20s. I think she might have only been 20 years old. And at that time, dad's only pursuit was to be an artist. He, he, he could paint and draw. And he was not going to do voice work. It, it, did, it was not on the radar at that time. So because he needed the money, he came to Hollywood, or they were actually already here in Hollywood, but he went looking for work as a voice artist in, uh, you know, in radio just to get any kind of a job because he needed the money. She was sick. She eventually passed away, and uh, that, that devastated him and changed him forever, and he would never talk about it. And to see the progression from where he was to what he became is absolutely fascinating because all that work in radio led to doing on-screen work and motion pictures, but he never became like a leading man or anything like that. He, he did do a lot of guest starring uh, in movies opposite uh, Humphrey Bogart and... Uh, with uh, Frank Sinatra, he did a lot of movies, but that part of his career ambitions didn't really pan out, so he got into doing cartoon voices and then doing commercials, and that turned out to be his, his bailiwick. So to, to read that book and see the progression from where he started to, where he, to what he became is, is an, an amazing success story. And nowadays with YouTube and all the different things that people can look back on, and I, I really think it, 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 to me, it, it's a, this book is a very satisfying beginning look at, at the, the person. Well, I think Ben did a fantastic job with it, and I don't think you'll find a better biography about my dad. Uh, it's, it, it's not a hundred percent complete because I didn't tell him everything there is to know, but it's pretty complete. It's it's pretty good. What do you think with the ghost host? Because nowadays people are, of course, with the 45th anniversary, um, Fiends and Ghouls, as, as you know, Darkest Jack and I were at Scare LA, and we had a panel going on with Alice Davis and Bob Gurr, and we talked about the Haunted Mansion itself. Um, it just amazes me how an attraction, how a concept that was born so many years ago is still fresh today. Well, it's still fresh because you got new generations going in there that have never seen it. Uh, and you can't improve upon perfection. I mean, how do you, how do you make it better? It's, uh, it's, it's thrilling. It's delightful. It's fun. Uh, and you got to give credit to Walt Disney. The guy was just a visionary, and, and most of his ideas are are the, are, the, are, are just long lasting. They're enduring. I particularly like the idea that he said that the outside needed to be kept pristine, clean, but they could do whatever they want with the inside. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. No, he, Walt was an amazing man. I, I I got to meet him a couple times, but it would have been nice to have known him. Uh, in more depth because he, he was a true visionary and it's great that my that he and my father got to work together so much. Do you remember anything on what he was like or or any memories at all of what Walt Disney was like? Not really. He was, he was nice. You know, he was nice to me um, but I was just a kid so <laughs> I can't imagine him being uh anything but a nice guy to kids but uh that movie saving mr mr banks that that was pretty insightful as to what walt could be like um I've, i found that to be uh very illuminating and i also found out that i need to take a, a box of kleenex to that movie because at the end i, I was tearing up <laughs> yeah it, it was great no it was uh that was a great film. And the most fascinating to me about 
your work of your father is to walk into the haunted mansion or to great moments with Mr. Lincoln and just have an appreciation for what your uh, the legacy that your father left, and to think that people coming into the parks now are going to be taking whatever story he told and whatever character that he played to take that home and and make that a part of their lives. Well, that's that's the best thing about it. I don't think he ever would inv- have envisioned that it would be so enduring that it would last this long that future generations would still embrace the work that he did and if, if, he, if he was still here I'm sure he'd, he'd be thrilled about that because to me when you encourage people in any way whether uh, because to me Disneyland and theme parks are places of escape they go and then you have quality family time and to me in a society of like today that is most important absolutely and dad definitely wanted to contribute i mean it it was his job on the one hand but on the other hand he very much wanted to you know leave something behind and, and he did with the advent of the star wars film coming next year the the uh fantastic fan base that is building up for that movie I can only think back to the late 70s when your father narrated the hardware wars yeah uh, I was roommates with Ernie Vesalius at one time actually housemates we both lived in the same house for several months in the early 70s and Ernie showed an amazing gift for using a video camera when there really were no video cameras in the early 70s. There were no VCRs. There was none of that. And he he happened to have one, and he would make these little shorts, funny bits and things with music and insects running around or sitting on a bus. And when I found out later that he had done Hardware Wars, it, it did not surprise me because that was exactly the kind of thing that Ernie was best at doing and the story is i i worked up there at an animation studio and the the radio director his name was walt kramer i worked with walt for two years and apparently walt was helping install the studio into my dad's home Hmm. in the early 70s when people didn't have home studios yet but dad for various reasons had the need for recording at home so he wouldn't have to go and travel to do it and in in lieu of paying him for extra studio work he asked dad if he would just do a few lines for this little movie project they were doing and dad agreed and recorded the lines that are in hardware wars and later on it became very popular and dad saw it on cable and was like outraged. How did they get my voice? How, what's going on here? I, I don't remember doing that. I didn't get paid for that. And they had to remind him later that he had agreed to do it <laughs> for Walt and for Ernie uh, for, for trading in the studio time. So that was kind of funny because dad, I told you, he didn't remember anything he did anyway. But this turned out to be a real shock to him because he, d- he really didn't remember doing it. And he didn't get paid to do it. And yet still, he he left his mark on films like that because I remember the first time that I saw it, Fiends and Ghouls, and it was funny and it, it was relevant and to this day, I still get a chuckle out of it. Oh, it's hilarious. It, it's, uh, it, it was, of course, Ernie, when he did it, he, he couldn't think of anyone else better to do it than Dad. And he was right, because it, it, it's, it's got so much humor in it. Um, it's so silly. It, it's, it's just funny. And it was the it was the best parody of Star Wars that I'd ever seen. So uh, having Dad do that narration was was really perfect. I mean, how who can get out of their head the fact that the spaceship was a toaster and that, that, that its weapons were two pieces of toast? Well, 
that was Ernie's budget. He didn't have any money, so it, it just it was whatever it took to make it, and that was perfect. And just the way Dad said "Augie Ben Doggy," and you know, it, it was hilarious. <laughs> See, even to this day, that still makes me laugh. <laughs> Well, hopefully people will still still buy it. There again, it's something that, that he did that, that, to me, is timeless. I, I've always wondered what George Lucas ever thought about it, but I never, I never found that out. Then again, it also talks about artistry and, and even your filmmaker friend. They never knew what was going to happen with it, and then it just caught on. Oh, absolutely! It's a cult favorite. Uh, it's it's it, it was very very good. I mean, and, and like I said, it was not a surprise to me because Ernie was very very good at making funny videos, and he outdid himself with that one. What do you think your father would say about the state of of audio recording nowadays? Because I know it was a lot different back then with with microphones and reel-to-reel -reel tapes or things like that what what do you think he would say about the technology uh well I, a little bit of this and a little bit of that I'm, i as long as the end product came out good i don't think he'd complain about the, ch the change in technology um i think he'd be more concerned about how people are functioning in the industry in terms of their quality of work, their, their performance value, uh, this predilection for doing things on the cheap and trying to undercut everybody, doing things for $5 and $10 and dad was more concerned about professional quality and as long as the product is above standard he would have approved of it if it's substandard he would have disapproved of it um like i said he wasn't technological himself so that you can do it at home um uh, I, I think he would have appreciated computers and such but he never had a chance to see it And to know that, that even pre-computers and pre-all of this technology, to know that the artistry is still intact, um, uh, that, that's the part that is awesome to me. Well, that's the important part. My, my father, more than anything else, instilled in me the sense of professionalism and what it means to be a professional. And to do your absolute best to not to sh take shortcuts and to deliver what you promise and not to promise anything that you are not capable of delivering that's so, the, that is the key too to know um know your product well enough so that when you have to deliver it you're able to, to deliver it again and again and again absolutely and he certainly knew what he could deliver. It was just about everything. <laughs> uh, Dad, Dad was always amazing to me. I, you know, I and he he could be this incredibly huge figure because I'd see how other people react to my father. But at the same time, he was my dad. I saw Dad laying in bed with his hand on his throat because he couldn't talk, and his other hand on his forehead because he had a headache. And he's laying in bed, and he's just this poor guy just laying there. And I just sit next to him and try to try to make him feel better. And you know, he he really is just an, a regular guy after all. But he he also was incredibly gifted. Well, that I can agree on, and I, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to to speak with us because I I really think from the bottom of my heart that that he had some legendary work well I, I i i appreciate that kevin and it's a privilege for me to be able to talk to you and your listeners 
And I think also that our listeners do know because uh, a lot of them celebrate what is called Bats Day at the at Disneyland, where where all of the alternative rockers go, and and the one over and above the most famous attraction they always visit is the Haunted Mansion. That's what I keep hearing, <laughs> you know, and and that's not a surprise. It's it's a fantastic place. I just want to thank you again, Fred, for taking the time to speak with us, and we'll talk about it again soon. 